Theater presents Danny Thomas and Anne Francis. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Early Bird, starring Danny Thomas. And now, here is your hostess, Anne Francis. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Early Bird, starring Danny Thomas as Arnold. A G D E B. And eh, nothing. Eh, let's try this. Yeah. Arnie. Oh, hello, Ray. Well, how's it coming? It is, and I think I'm burned out. Burned out. Oh, sure. 20 years you've been writing top songs every two weeks, you burnt out. Well, it's going to happen eventually. Ah, don't talk silly. I wasn't asking about that. Uh, how's the speech coming? The speech? The speech. Tomorrow afternoon at the college commencement exercises. Oh, my gosh. What's the matter? I forgot. You haven't even started it? I forgot all about the thing. Arnold, get with it. It's tomorrow. I'll never make it. What? You got to get me off the hook. You're the principal speaker. Your name's all over the program. I'll get sick. That's it. I'll get sick. You can't get sick. You got to give the speech. I mean, I'll say I'm sick. No. Look, as a matter of fact, I am sick. I'm overworked. Oh, baby, if I'm your personal manager, you got to let me manage. You can't duck this thing. Everybody's coming, your family, your friends. Too late. I can't write a speech anyway. Arnold, you'll disgrace yourself. Look, I never went to college. I got nothing to say on the subject. They don't want you to talk about college. They want you to talk about yourself. Myself? You're a success, a big songwriter. That's what they want. What? The secret. How did you do it? Are you kidding Last year, they had this guy who won a Pulitzer Prize. He gets up, he tells him what a great man he is. I bet he went to college. In Gimbel's basement. Go on. I'm telling you, he doesn't even use commas. How I did it. Yeah. How you got to the top? I can't tell him that. They put me in a straitjacket. Well, change it around a little. Give me the old formula. Hard work, stick to whateverness, you know. Look, they throw rocks at me. All right. So don't tell him what really happened. Make it up. Yeah, yeah, make it up. I can't make up stuff like that. Sure you can. Just uh, twist it around a little. Tell them uh, you were a lifeguard instead of a milkman. I'll never get it done in time. The sooner that you start, the sooner you're through. Now I'll send over one of the girls from the office tomorrow morning to type it up. Ray, listen. No more excuses. Sit down and do it. I don't even know how to start. Start at the beginning. Only like I told you, change it around. See you tomorrow. Change it around. It's easy to say. Tell him you were a lifeguard instead of a milkman. I was a milkman. So what's wrong with being a milkman? 20 years ago, a kid like me was lucky to have a job at all, much less be a milkman. Milkman, it was a big deal. I liked it, too. Except for getting up so early. That was a trouble. So early, you never saw anybody but your horse. Of course, down at the dairy before I started out, I'd see some of the other drivers. Real nice guys, too. Except for Whitey. That one. Whitey Benson. Every morning, he was on me like an overcoat with his big mouth. Well, if it ain't Johann Sebastian. A Johann, you big ape. Written any operas lately? Nothing you'd be interested in. Say, I hear the dispatcher had a complaint from some people on your delivery route about all that off-key singing you do so early in the morning. What are you talking about? Yeah, they claim you're sour in the milk. 
<laughs> Gee, Whitey, with a sense of humor like you got, I don't know why you don't get on the radio. Uh, the reason I don't get on the radio is because it's more comfortable on the couch. <laughs> I don't get it. On the radio. You know, like sitting on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> Only I'm more comfortable sitting on the couch. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's the whole thing? Yeah, it's a joke. Gee, it's a riot. With a sense of humor like you got, I don't know why you don't get on Hey, the... what are you doing? Give me a bad time here. Oh, well, me? Make me look like a jerk. No, I really think you ought to be on the radio. Oh. Yeah? Yeah, instead of on the couch. I'm warning you, don't be a wise guy, see? Why do you put down the milk bottle? You mess with me, you're going to be sorry. You mess with me, I'll get my horse to kick you. Yeah? Well, just don't be so funny. I won't if you won't. Okay, okay. And I know you won't. No? Not with those jokes, kid. Get up, Louise. <laughs> Whitey Benson. Always give me the needle because I'm trying to write songs. Well, that's all right. Let them needle. I'll show them. Someday I'll save the life of a big music publisher from drowning or being run over by a vegetable truck or something. Then he'll needle with my name all over the papers. And when he finally gets nerve enough to come around, I'll tell him I'm taking my milk from another company. Boy, that'll be a good one. I'll show him one of these days. I'll be the greatest composer conductor in the whole world. She can just hear it now. Ladies and gentlemen, we bring you the Krauss Milk and Philharmonic. And here is your conductor, Arnold Castor. For my first number, I'd like to play a composition of my own. And now I raise my baton and... Oh! Good grief, I didn't see that bottle there. Must have been the one Whitey took out, that big ape. And I'll get docked for it. I'm not going to pay for it. When I get back to the dairy, I'll tell him what's what. And if he doesn't cough up the 12 cents, I'll sock him in the nose. Right in the nose. Just like that. Say, Whitey. What do you want, Gershwin? I had a little accident this morning. You know the bottle of milk you were fooling around with? Now, what about it? Well, uh, you didn't put it back in a case and it, well, it got knocked down and, and, and broke. That's too bad, kid. Well, since it was partly your fault and I'm going to get docked for it, I figured you being a right guy, you'd want to do the right thing. Take a sneak, Beethoven. I got troubles of my own. Look, if it happened the other way around, I'd split with you. Well, it didn't happen the other way around, so... Oh, wait a minute. If I pay you for that bottle, will you do me a little favor? Sure. Like I say, Whitey, I'm a right guy, and if it was the other way around... Yeah, here's 12 cents. Now, you promise? Sure, I promise. I'm willing to do the right thing. Good. Here's a quarter cottage cheese. I forgot to deliver it this morning. Drop it off for me, will you? I got a golf date. Well, wait a minute. Where do I take it? Name's McNabb, 1714 Locust. Locust? That's the other side of town. You promised, and I gave you the 12 cents, didn't I? But I'll be all day getting there. Are you going to do it, or should I spread the word you're a Welsher? Okay. Okay, but you wait. You wait, Whitey. I won't forget this. Make sure you don't. They called the boss up and said they want the cheese there by noon. You know, if Whitey hadn't schmoosed me into delivering that cottage cheese, a lot of things that happened never would have. You see, I drove all the way back across town, and by then, the sun had been up a couple of hours, and the inside of my wagon was like a baked potato. Locust Street. What a snazzy neighborhood that was. Great big houses, wide lawns, lots of trees. 714 was one of those two-story colonial jobs with white pillars in front. I'd already climbed out of the wagon, was coming up the walk when I saw this lovely thing come out on the front porch and yell at me. Milkman! Yoo-hoo! Milkman! Yeah, that's me. That's me. You're the one who's waiting for the cottage cheese? Yes. Can you hurry, please? Hey, hurry is my middle name. <laughs> oh, you don't have to run. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. Look out for the garden home. Oh, don't you worry about me. I'll be... Look out! Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Are you all right? Yeah, but look at everything all over the lawn. Oh, you're lucky you weren't killed. That was a terrible fall you took. I'm okay, but the cottage cheese is ruined. What 
What is happening out there? Oh, Daddy, it's the milkman. He fell down. Oh, he fell. I never saw such a mess in my... Uh, you all right? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. McNabb. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't see the hose. <laughs> well, I don't know how you missed it, right in plain sight. Well, I was running to deliver the cottage cheese. Oh, the cottage cheese. You brought it? Yeah, I brought it, but... Yeah, my wife's been going crazy. We've got company for lunch, and it's got to be Krause's cottage cheese. But, sir, it's, it's uh, all over the lawn. <laughs> Look, <laughs> Oh, no. Can't eat that. Well, go out to your wagon and get some more. A wagon? Uh, hurry, boy, hurry. But I haven't got any more in the wagon. Uh, you what? All I had was one quart. Oh, of all the idiotic things. Well, it was a special order. What kind of delivery service do you call this? Daddy, it wasn't his fault. You keep out of this. Uh, what's your name? Well, uh, uh... Caster, uh, Arnold Caster, sir, but uh, I'm not the regular driver on this route. You won't be the regular driver on any route when I get through telling Bill Krause how you're wrecking his business. But it was an accident. I couldn't help it. Oh, come on in the house, Jerry. Right away, Daddy. Uh, Caster, huh? <laughs> oh, yes, well, I won't forget that name. Boy, this is sure my day. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, it's my own fault. should have seen that hose. I know why you didn't. Yeah? You were looking at me. Well, it was worth the look. <laughs> Gee, you really flew through the air. <laughs> I never saw so much milk in my life. I thought I stepped into an open manhole. <laughs> <laughs> hey, does your old man, uh, your father really know Mr. Krause, the guy that owns a dairy? Oh, sure. They're old friends. But don't worry about what he said. He'll forget all about it when he cools off. You really think so? Sure. He'll stomp into the house now to show Mother how mad he is. And she'll be so busy trying to calm him down, she'll forget all about the cottage cheese. That's the whole idea. Gosh, I hope you're right. Gee, he must be kind of a big deal, your old uh, uh, father, man, dad. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, to know a guy like Krause. <laughs> sure he is. You've heard of Toot McNabb, haven't you? The orchestra leader? Sure. That old... Your father, I mean, is Toot McNabb, the orchestra leader on the radio? He's the one. Holy smoke, and I think what I'd give to meet a guy like that. See, I'm a songwriter. Really? Yeah, and what a break it'd be if... Uh, uh, Jerry, it's time for lunch. Yes, Daddy, I'm coming. Oh, aren't you gone yet? Oh, yes, sir, I was just leaving. Oh, yes, well, then do it, and don't let me see you around here again. No, sir, I mean, yes, sir. I mean, I mean, you won't see me around, Mr. McNabb, don't you worry. <laughs> Oh, will I ever forget those next three weeks. I went around like a man in a dream, and then a nightmare. I'd fallen in love with Jerry McNabb, and I didn't have nerve enough to do anything about it. And I wanted an old man to listen to my songs, but I knew if he even saw me around the house, he'd call the cops. The cops. Hmm. I know what made me think of that. By the time things came to a wind-up, every cop in town was after me. And it all started so innocently. The morning before Whitey went on his vacation. Well, how's tricks, Mozart? Look, Whitey, will you take your gag somewhere else this morning? I'm not feeling so peppy. Uh, you still drive back to the dairy every day by way of Locust Street? What do you know about that? Don't get sore, kid. I got eyes. You, uh, you kind of like that McNabb girl, don't you? So what? You figure her old man might be able to give you some help with those songs of yours? You listen to me. I'd like her even if you were her old man. <laughs> he really got it bad, huh? Will that be all right with you? Well, don't get sore. Just thinking I might be able to give you a little help getting connected over there. And just how would you do that? Well, it ain't much, but I'm going on my vacation tomorrow. I was thinking maybe you'd like to take over my route while I'm gone. Are you kidding? No. At least it'd give you an official excuse to stop by the place every day. Gee, why do you think the boss would let me do it? Sure. If I recommend you. Uh-oh. I get it. What's the catch? No catch. Somebody's going to get the route while I'm gone. Might as well be you. No kidding? Sure. Gee, why do you... I guess I had you all wrong. Ah, yeah, forget it. Look, if I can ever pay you back in any way... Believe me, kid, just knowing while I'm away that you'll be handling things... That's pay enough. I might have known if I'd been using one half of my head, I could have figured Whitey wasn't handing me something for nothing. But I was too excited. This meant I'd go to Jerry's house every morning. 
I was going to make it the last stop on the route, like 9.30 or 10 o'clock. I had another scheme in mind. I was going to leave my songs with her in an envelope with a note, and maybe she'd get her old man to look at them. Well, I set up half that night writing lead sheets. And the next morning, about a quarter to ten after I'd made all the other deliveries, I climbed out of my milk wagon in front of 714 Locusts, started to walk along the side of the house that led to the back porch. Hey, this place is pretty quiet for 10 o'clock in the morning. Anyhow, they left a note in the milk bottles. I... What's this? Dear Milkman, just to remind you, we're leaving town for three weeks in the mountains. Please do not make any more deliveries until further notice. Oh, brother, she's gone. They're all gone. How do you like? time she comes home, three weeks, I'll be back on my old route. Hello there. Huh? Oh, oh, hello. I didn't think there was anybody home. Yeah, uh, there isn't, I'm afraid. I just got in from New York last night and found they were all gone. Oh, you a member of the family? Uh, in a way, yes. I'm Uncle Jim, uh, Toot's brother. Oh. Oh, what happened to your arm? I lost my footing on a train platform last week. I chipped a bone in the elbow. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, it doesn't hurt anymore, but... Wearing this cast kind of reduces my efficiency. Yeah, I, I can see how it would. Uh, say, as a matter of fact, uh, since you seem to be rather sympathetic, uh, there's a few things you could give me a hand with, if you would. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, come on in. See, I wanted to send a note off to my wife, and I can't seem to get the stationery drawer in Ed's writing desk open. Oh, I'll open it for you. I sure will appreciate that. Uh, right here in the library. Uh, Ed, is that uh, Toots? I mean, uh, Mr. McNabb's real name? Yes. <laughs> I never can bring myself to call him that uh, other thing. He's a, he's a pretty famous guy. <laughs> Pride of the family. Oh, uh, here we are. Is that the desk? Mm-hmm. The note paper and the envelopes are usually kept in the wide bottom drawer. This one? Yes. Mm, opens pretty easy. Uh, when you've got two hands... Uh... Oh, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't see any envelopes or writing paper in here. Just ribbons and labels and stuff. Well, that's strange. Uh, that's usually where he keeps it. Uh, would you mind trying the drawer above it? Oh, you bet. Nope. Wrapping paper, old Christmas cards. Uh, how about the little drawer up on the right side? This one? Mm-hmm. Looks like it might be a place for stationery. Oh, yeah, this is it. Oh, fine. Well, I certainly appreciate this. Not at all. Glad to help. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'll be going. Oh, uh, don't forget your own envelope here. Oh, yeah, I was going to leave it, but since they're all gone... Uh, is it the milk bill or something? No, 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 it's not that. I can forward it to Ed if you want me to. Oh, n well, <laughs> to tell you the truth, Mr. McNabb, it's a couple of songs I wrote. Songs? Yeah, yeah, and a note I was going to leave for Jerry. I mean, Miss McNabb. Uh, are you the one? The one what? The one that Jerry wrote us about. The milkman who writes songs. She, she, she wrote, wrote about me? <laughs> Just last week. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. Yeah. I didn't even think she remembered me that well. And these are some of your songs. Well, they're just lead sheets and some chords. I, I was hoping maybe she could get Toot, I mean, her old dad, uh, her father, I mean, to look at them. <laughs> well, why don't you leave them here? I'll, I'll see that he gets them. Would you? I, I mean, I mean, could you really? I'd be happy to. Gosh, I'd never be able to thank you. Of course, I can't promise anything will come of it. Oh, I, I know that, but uh, I mean, if he could just get him to look at it. <laughs> I think I can guarantee that much. Uh, after all, you've done me a good turn. Gosh, I can't tell you. Now, don't mention it. Uh, just leave them here on the piano. I'll mail them to him this afternoon. Uh, okay. Uh, do you want me to send along the note for Jerry, too? Oh, no, I, I'll take that out. I'll give it to her when she gets back. Next time I see her. <laughs> I understand, son. Well, I, I better be going. This sure is swell of you, Mr. McNabb. Now, you just forget it. Maybe someday when you get to be a big name, you'll remember me. <laughs> remember him? I'll say I remembered him, and I didn't have to wait until I was a big name either. That night, when the cops came up to my room in a boarding house, he was all I could remember. But they thought I was just trying to be a wise guy. Look, Caster, your fingerprints were all over the place. On a desk, on a piano. I told you how that happened. I was helping Mr. McNabb's brother because he had a broken arm. Speaking of broken arms, Lieutenant, uh, no rough stuff, Al. 
Look, I didn't steal anything. This is your last chance. I'm innocent. Where did you hide the stuff? What stuff? The jewels and furs. I never saw any jewels and furs. Lieutenant, I'm telling you, this kid needs his memory jogged a little. Uh, I said no. Look, I was just in the house five minutes. You're a fast worker. Well, you made your mistake was leaving those songs behind you. I meant to leave him behind. See what I mean? He's hysterical. Maybe if I just slap him out of it now, just a little... Now, for the last time, no. Lieutenant, you gotta believe me. I didn't steal anything. Okay, kid. Have it your way. Come on. Where are we going? Over to the McNabb place. You can tell him your story. But I thought they were out of town. That's what give you the idea to loot the place, huh? No, they left it in the milk bottle. The jewels? No, a note saying they went to the mountain. All right, kid, let's go. Look, do we have to go over there? What's the matter? Well, Jerry's old man, I mean, her father told me not to come around the house anymore. We got an opinion about that too, Sonny. What do you mean? You should have taken his advice. <laughs> I never spend another hour like that next one. All the way across town, racing like mad with the siren wide open. And when we get to Locust Street, there's a big crowd out in front. More squad cars, people gawking. The two cops hustle me up the front walk and in the front door like I'm public enemy number one or something. And the first person I see when they shove me into the living room is Jerry. Arnold, why did you do it? I didn't do it, Jerry, honest. Shut up, heister. This the man, Mr. McNam? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes, he's the one. Oh, Castor, I'm ashamed of you. But I'm innocent. A boy of your promise. Your talent. Talent? Daddy was just running over your songs. He thinks they're great. All right, all right, let's skip the bouquets. This guy says your brother let him in the house. I don't even have a brother. Oh, Castor, why don't you admit your guilt and face the music? But I didn't take anything. Maybe you'll get off with a light sentence. And start with a clean slate. You can be sending me songs while you're in prison. But I've got a clean slate. Jerry, this guy let me into the house and said he was your Uncle Jim and how you'd written him about my songs. But, Arnie, I don't have an Uncle Jim. But he knew all about me. I told you these little guys can be stubborn, Lieutenant. Okay, I'll put the cuffs on. With pleasure. Arnie. Of all the dirty tricks. And I thought Whitey was doing me a favor. Huh? Who's Whitey? Nobody. Regular milkman on this route. He was just trying to help me out because he knew I wrote songs and had a crush. Hey, wait a minute. Don't oh, get frisky, kid. I got it. It was Whitey. It was Whitey what? This is how they always start, Lieutenant. Sure, it has to be. He knew all about the songs. Should I tap him just a little? No. Always giving me the need. What about He's Whitey? He's the one. He framed me. Whitey Benson, the other milkman. That's why he wanted me to take over the route. Arnie, Arnie, do you think you can prove this? Sure, he must have been working with this other guy, Mr. McNabb, your brother. I don't have any brothers. Well, everybody stop yelling around. I mean, the guy who said he was your brother. That's how he got me to leave my fingerprints all over the place. Castor. Do you know that attempting to implicate an innocent person in a felony is another felony? He can't be innocent. He's the only one who knew enough to frame me. Where's this guy Benson live? I don't know. They could tell you at the dairy. He's on vacation. Sonny, if you're giving us a run around... I'm not, I tell you. You'll find Whitey and you'll find the stuff. I'll bet that was stolen. At least it's worth trying, isn't it, Lieutenant? Maybe. Just maybe. I can't really believe a boy like this would do such a thing. Well, that's it. Had us puzzled all along. What a lieutenant means is to pull on a job like this takes brains. Will you shut up? Ain't that what you said? Go out in the car and take Raffles here with you. You still gonna lock me up? Until we find Benson. Don't worry, Arnold. We know you're innocent. Yes, of course. I'll get my lawyer on the phone, and you'll be out of jail in an hour. Oh, Daddy, you're wonderful. Gee, I'll never be able to repay you, Mr. McNabb. Oh, oh, oh well, now, don't kid yourself. <laughs> I'll take it out of your first royalties. Royalty? Why, sure, son. You're a composer now. Composer. From milkman to composer in one easy lesson. Well, it's a cinch I can't tell that success secret to any graduating class. Let's see now. Yeah? How's the speech coming? Hi, honey. Not very good. Well, Arnie, we're all going to be so proud sitting out in that audience tomorrow, listening to you. We? You're bringing the kids? Of course. They wouldn't miss it for the world. You'll give a fine speech. What have you got so far? Just a couple of notes. I can't tell him what really got me started as a composer. I don't know why not. No, no. I, I figured I'd start off something like, uh, Mr. President, honored members of the faculty, graduates, and friends. 
The few remarks I have to make this afternoon concern the word success. What does the word really mean, success? And after you've achieved it, how much credit do you really deserve? I ask this question, not so much of you as of myself, because when I walked up on this platform a few moments ago, I intended to reassure you that all success is the result of hard work and constant application. I still believe that's necessary, but sometimes, as my wife reminded me yesterday, a little good luck can help too. I know that for a fact. You see, even though I always wanted to be a composer, I didn't start out that way. In fact, I started as a milkman. And that was a pretty good deal. 20 years ago, a kid my age was lucky to have a job at all. And I liked it too, being a milkman, except for having to get up so early. Well, this one morning... This is Anne Francis again. A listener once asked us how we managed to present such a variety of plays week after week and always end with the same theme, family prayer. Well, here's the secret, if it can be called a secret. There isn't a thing in life that doesn't somehow tie in with the family, that isn't somehow of interest to it, because the family is the basis of all society and civilization. Whether it's baseball or babies, railroads or religion, it's connected with the family, and the family theater listeners like to hear about it. In the same way, there isn't anything in life that isn't connected with God, who created and sustains the world and all that is in it. So it's never an effort to introduce the thought of prayer, family prayer. After all, do we possess anything that doesn't come from the hand of God? And isn't it only sensible that we should pray together as a family for the graces we need each day? That's why we leave you each week with a thought we'd like you to make your own. The family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Early Bird, starring Danny Thomas. Anne Francis was your hostess. Others in our cast were Gloria Grant, Howard McNear, Jack Crucian, Howard Culver, and John Larch. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of state, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home, and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Teresa Wright and William Bendix. Join us, won't you? Now we suggest that you stay tuned for the latest news which follows immediately as reported by Charles Arlington over most of these stations. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.